Sayyid Hadi Rizvi, who is currently a UK-based lecturer, Islamic researcher, and religious community counsellor. He left his degree at the London University in 2009 to study at the Religious Seminary and Al Mustafa International University in Qom, Iran. Since his return from the seminary eight years later, he has been lecturing at the Hausa Ilmi of England, presenting and participating in workshops at the UK universities and academic institutions. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'd like to start by thanking everyone here for attending, to Al Mahdi for Al Mahdi Institute for facilitating the discussion um, and for having such a cordial uh, um, gathering to discuss, which could be very sensitive topics. Um, and I'd also like to thank you for your presentation. It covered much of what I want to also cover in my discussion um, and I'll just add some parts. Before I begin, and also I want to mention this, that the historical sources, what I'll be presenting here is the view and the sentiments of, let's say, the majority of the Shia scholars. Um, whether this is put down explicitly in books or what's passed down through tradition. Um, it's not necessarily my own reading of all of the events and what the, the implications, but it is the view of the majority of the Shia scholars. The sources are very similar, the sources that are used. One point I will mention is that some points are taken directly, explicitly from the texts that are mentioned. Some of them are taken from an understanding of the surroundings. So they're implicit um, implications of what the text will be saying. So if, um, we look at what was happening, we look at the different events that are taking place, we look at the different conversations, and through that we derive certain... So introduction, why is the discussion important? In view of the Shias, this has been... Um, this event, this gathering at Saqifah, is basically the most... In, one of the most influential um, incidents and events that impacted the rest of Islamic history, the history of the Muslims. To even understand the current dynamics today, different countries within one country, between different communities, it's important for us to go back and see why do certain communities have certain sentiments towards individuals or groups um, and why would they behave in a particular way? We can find the roots of many of these differences in the gathering of Saqifa or what was understood from the gathering of Saqifa. Um, and most Shia scholars believe that the gathering of Saqifa, it was a catalyst for many of the unfortunate events that befell not only the Shia community, but more importantly, the family of the Prophet. And they believe had Saqifa not happened the way it did, or had it happened differently, then these such tragedies would not have befell the family. So the Shia, they rebuild, and they rebuild the account of Saqifah and I'll, I'll try not to repeat what was already said and we'll try and get through the slide quickly and hopefully get into the discussions which are more important. Um, so using various early historical sources and such, uh, many of, so Shias used many of the early historical sources, so many of the details of what occurred are not very different to what the Sunni account offers. The major differences lie in the understanding of the events and whether the events were themselves um, did they lead to the legitimacy of the Caliphate? The Shia analysis comes from both details of the events and the conversations that took place <coughs> and then what's been recorded in the books of history. So they look at what were the arguments that each party or the different parties within the <coughs> gathering presented for um, their view. And also the reading of the Shias comes from their general theology that they um, take from the general teachings of the Ahlul Bayt. So when they're approaching history, it's not purely just <coughs> looking at the text. In the back of their minds, they have a, a list of, they have a whole uh, preconceived notions and beliefs about how leadership and all of this should look like. And so this also impacts the reading of those historical texts. So all that being said, there's no one, and it's the same, I believe, for uh, the Ahlul Sunnah, that there's no one book that the Shias would solely rely on to discuss the matter 
of Satifa. Issues that she has had with how the meeting took place. So we heard how the meeting took place. Just to um, mention, uh, to add a few more points, what was understood is that the Ansar, they, began, they um, initiated this meeting. They had not invited the Muhajirun. Why did they do this? What was behind this? Some Shia scholars have said that this was uh, because after the Fatah of Mecca, so until before the Fatah of Mecca, the Ansar were very comfortable in their position as being the helpers of Islam. And they very well knew that they had the influence. Medina was in their hands. They were uh, the most influential party. But after the Fatah of Mecca, and now we, had, we see that there's a whole new dynamic. So now we have a new stronghold, we have a new city. The Quraysh are now again powerful. This creates um, a new consideration for the Ansar. And this is why some, not Shia scholars, but Orientalists, and um, we're, not, we're not discussing their views here. Some of them have believed that the Ansar, they have used this point to argue that the Ansar actually were trying to elect a leader for Medina <coughs> and not for the whole Muslim Ummah. But this is very difficult to prove, especially because of the arguments that took place in the discussions. Anyhow, so why did it happen? It's not explicit, it's not completely clear, um, but we do know it was to elect a leader. The problems that, uh, so what was happened, the main problem that the Shias have the first and foremost is that this event, this gathering happened while the Prophet still had not been bathed and shrouded, <coughs> right? And the reason that Bani Hashim and Banu Hashim was not there were because they were busy in bathing the Prophet. They were conducting the burial rites of the Prophet before the burial itself. So this is the first major red flag for the Shia community that could this not have waited even for a day because um, it said that the Prophet was buried the next day or the day after depending on the reports you take. So such an important meeting was convened without the presence of many other prominent companions, particularly Imam Ali, the rest of Banu Hashim, Abbas. Um, and this discussion was imposed on the entire Muslim Ummah without their consultation and without true justification. And it's not representative of the nation's decision. Now, yes, the nation accepted it, but it, did they have a role in deciding? This is something that can be... Uh, that the Shias believed that they did not have, that it wasn't uh, representative of everyone's opinion. Another problem they have that the first and second caliphs listen, had they listened to the Prophet, had the first and caliphs listened to the Prophet, they shouldn't have even been in the city of Medina at the time of his passing. He'd asked them to join the Jaysh of Osama. Had they listened to his um, command even, they would have not been present in the city. Um, and this is why the Prophet made this decision. He asked him to be there in the state knowing these were possibly the last days of his life. So it was very much the possibility that he would not be, that they would not be in the city when this event happened. So had he wanted a shura to happen or anything else, particularly directly after his demise, then these individuals, had they listened to the Prophet from the beginning, would not have been in the city. So how is it possible that such an individual or such individuals became the leaders? It's still possible. The people could have elected them while they're not there. But um, had they not been there, it had been a much less likely chance that they would have become the leaders. So this is another problem that the Shias have with how the election and who was elected. And also they believe that the Prophet on numerous occasions uh, introduced Imam Ali as the rightful leader or person to be followed, or at least introduce enough merit of Imam Ali to the community to make him the most suitable um, candidate for this position. Other issues. The motives for the meeting were questionable, as was the general spirit. Right? So issues that she has had with how the meeting took place. Argue, so they, these are the issues, and we'll mention them one by one as quickly as we can. Arguments that were used were in stark contrast to the teachings of the Prophet and the Quran. What were the arguments that were used within the gathering of Saqifa? How, were each, how was each side proving their suitability for being the best candidate? She has believed that the arguments that they were using were actually themselves problematic. 
the method of selection had no true sustainable logic. It was not something that could be constantly repeated. There was no real structure to it. Um, and this is something which was even repeated by the second khalif when he referred to it as felt as something which happened without planning um, almost ad hocly. And then he said that the that God had protected the Ummah from the evils of this decision. But the Shias believed that there was no sustainable logic and hence it's, and that's why the way that this decision was made was itself not repeated. So the selection of the second caliph and the third caliph and even the fourth happened completely differently to the selection of the first. And of course the idea that this, there was no shar that was gained from this uh, the second caliph was able to say this because up until his life, there may have been, or up until before even his rulership, there have been, may have been limited repercussions on, for example, the family of the Prophet and some of the members of society. But um, later in his own life or later in, for, after his life, let's say at least for example, the caliph handed up in the, hand, in the likes of Yazid and Ma'aviyah. So because there was no sustainable logic in how to choose, we ended up seeing that the caliphate was now in the hands of other individuals, which majority of the people would say were problematic or not suitable for leadership of the Muslim Ummah. Issues that, uh, okay, continuing. The decision was made in haste without the necessary preliminary. We've just mentioned this. Uh, how could the companions cons be concerned about the situation after the Prophet, but he himself not be concerned? So how could the companions be so concerned that they would leave the burial rites of the Prophets, go and choose someone? And this is something that did not concern the Prophet himself. This is an issue that the Shias take with how it was done. Um, and also the way that it was, some, according to the Shia narrative in al jamla of Sheikh Mufid, he says that... Um, he mentions a narration where it says that the second caliph actually was demanding the allegiance from other companions and he would even hit them on the back of their heads and their foreheads, right? If they, were, if they weren't giving it, uh, if they didn't give it immediately. Of course, that's a sheer narration. Um, problematic arguments made during and for the meeting. So one is with the meeting itself, one is with the actual arguments that were made. The Ansar were more deserving of the Caliphate because of the assistance of Islam with their wealth and swords. This was an argument that was made. The issue that the Shias have with this is that this is not something they should try and use as a favor upon others. If it was done sincerely and for the sake of Allah, then they should not require that they get something in return for it. At least not from the people, at least not from the nation. If this was done purely for the sake of God, this is not something that they should use as a minna. They should not use this as something which people now are, owe them a favor. However, as the Muhajirs answered them, that the Muhajirun were the first Muslims and they went through even more difficulties in, when it came to Islam, the Sha'b of Abi Talib, all of these other situations where the Muhajirun went through extreme difficulties. The other argument, among the Ansar, there was doubt about the validity of such arguments. Even the Ansar themselves, and we had saw the discussions um, that Mufti Saab mentioned, some of, even between themselves, they didn't accept the arguments that they were making. So they knew that these arguments aren't solid. Uh, and those among them willing to argue for leader of the Ansar and a leader from the Muhajirun. So some said, look, let's have a leader from the Ansar and a leader from the Muhajirun. And this seems to be after because it's not clear exactly when each conversation happened and which each comment made. So this seems to have happened. Uh, there seems to be an argument, rebuttal, argument, rebuttal situation. So this seems to have been after the Muhajirun made their statements and then Issue, what could cause two groups of Muslims not to accept each other, right? So if, why do we need two, why do we need two leaders? What is the problem? The one thing is that two leaders wouldn't work, as Mufti Saab mentioned. The other issue is, what is the problem within the community themselves, after all the teachings of the Qur'an, about how a person should be, um, how we should, what are the criterions for accepting someone, what are the criterions for honoring someone, revering someone? With all of those criterions, why is it then problematic? Why can why can they accept one leader? Why did they, why is this an idea that we need? We should have two leaders. Why is that a solution? So this shows a problematic uh, spirit within the attendees of that gathering. Um, and where is the spirit of brotherhood and criterion? Again, these are all the issues that Shias have taken with the arguments that were made at 
Saqifah. The argument that there was no sharh from it. This is, many, uh, the Shia narrations are actually quite um, explicit in. Not, or well, I shouldn't say explicit. They actually try and refute this claim that there was no sharh from it. For example, from one of the um, sermons of Imam Ali and Nahj al-Balagha, he said that this resulted after when Allah took the soul of the messenger, a group turned on their heels, referring to the verse of the Quran, that they turned on the aqab. Should the Prophet die, would you turn back? And then he continues talking about, he says that they showed consideration to other than kinsmen, referring to Banu Hashim himself, that other people were selected other than Banu Hashim. But then what's interesting here is that he says they are the source of every shortcoming and the door for every evil opportunist in the dark. That this result, this decision that was taken and this conclusion that came out of it, this result of the caliphate going in the hands of other than the Ahl bayt this will result in continuous evil. Every evil that comes after it, at least within the Muslim Ummah context, can be linked back to this. And again, co comments by Imam Ali himself regarding the, how he, uh, when he met the first caliph, how did he respond to him? Uh, when he said that this, you have, the way that you have chosen has been unfair for us. And over here, the first caliph did, as Mufti Saad mentioned, he did not try and reject this, but he said that, I fear the fitna. The problem that the Shias would have with this reply is that um, we'll, we'll leave that for uh, I'll leave that for now. And then just the discussion that the Ahlul Bayt did not actually, um, according to some reports, for six months. Some mention lower forty days. Some mention three. Most of them mention six months. The Banu Hashim did not. The Banu Hashim did not come and give bayah during the life of Lady Fatima. And after that, they did. Question arises: Why did that happen? Some Shia sources seem to indicate it was because of the fear that after, because of what, how they believed that the Lady Fatima left this world, they believed that they realized the threat of not giving allegiance could lead to the stage where it could lead to the individual martyrdoms and that's when Banu Hashim started to give. Did Imam Ali pay allegiance or not? No Shia hadith, hadith including any saying of Imam Ali and Shia sources, state explicitly that he gave allegiance to the Caliph. Most of the sources that say he did were historical sources. This is not to say then that means it didn't happen because um, we don't need explicit hadith to say it happened for us to believe that it happened. It's still possible that he did, but at least we have no sheer uh, content that says it. His comments in his sermons and statements, for example, the Shaq Shaqiyah, whether it was a sermon or whether it was a conversation with an individual, suggests that he was never pleased with the caliphate of those who had assumed it. This means even if he had given allegiance, it's highly unlikely that it was done willingly or happily. So even if Imam Ali had given the allegiance, what we see from his comments through his own lifetime and his own caliphate is that he was never completely happy or satisfied with the taking of the caliphate in the beginning. So it, it's possible that it was forced. If the goals he wished to achieve were achievable without paying his allegiance, it would make the claim that he did give allegiance even more problematic. That's more of a Shia, uh, theological approach. And this is why classical Shia scholars have rejected that he paid allegiance. Um, for example, Sharif Murtaza. Sharif Murtaza rejects that Imam Ali paid allegiance. Again, he also doesn't have explicit text. I should, to be fair, I should mention here that he doesn't have explicit <coughs> text to mention that Imam Ali didn't pay allegiance. He's using a more of a theological argument over here. Um, was the caliphate of the first Khalifa, um, Hazrat Abu Bakr, was it legitimate according to the Shias or not? It's clear that the caliphate of uh, Abu Bakr was not in no way legitimate or acceptable to the Shias. Their problem with it is both theologically because of all the circumstances surrounding it, which increase its illegitimacy even more. So theologically, they don't believe that the decision should be made by the people. This is something that they believe was an extension of the prophethood. It was, play, it was to continue some of the um, functions of prophethood on a much smaller level. And hence, but it was not something that the people could choose, the imam we're talking about here. Shias do not believe that they are required to follow the rulers. Religiously speaking, they're not required to follow the rulers other than Ahlul Bayt. If they act in accordance to the laws, they do so for the sake of avoiding greater harm or discord and disunity, but believe ultimately true harmony can only come from the leadership of the rightful Imam. Essentially, 
what the Shias are doing is they're following the Imams because the Imams instructed the Shias to partake, partake in society. <coughs> they instructed them to um, not, they instructed, uh, said go to the mosque, go to the funerals of the Ahl Sunnah, go to the mosque, be a part of society. Don't pull yourselves away. So they did not allow them to pull themselves away in this regard. Um, so practically speaking, one of the practical outcome is that while they might not accept the caliphate, they weren't trying to cause disruption and discord while the caliphate was doing its work. And that's why you might find out even, uh, obviously the term Shia did not exist back then in this, with the same meaning, but those who preferred Imam Ali as a caliphate, you might see them taking part in the Fatuhad, they might be taking in the different campaigns of the Khulafa, um, and even advising them, even um, Imam Ali himself is said on many occasions to have advised the Khulafa, taken part in the councils that the second caliph had created from things like whether they should go through the war with the Romans or not, to what should the first month of the Is uh, Islamic calendar be. These are all things that they were involved in, even small things such as that and then large things such as military warfare. So practically that's how it turned out. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you.